Hi, my name is Andrew Francis and this is part two in my series on tithing and why I don't think it's applicable for Christians today. So we're going to look now at the Old Testament basis for tithing. We're going to look at a number of passages that we find both in the law, later on in the history books and in also the prophets. And when we look at these things, we will understand, I suppose, some of the basis of why people speak about tithing today. But then later on in my final talk, I'll explain why we can't simply take Old Testament passages and apply them for Christians now. The first passage that we find is in Genesis chapter 17, and it's verses 14 to 17. And um, the background behind it is that Abram has gone chasing after his nephew Lot, who has been attacked by a bunch of kings who have come in, taken him away, taken away the people of Sodom, taken away Lot's family. And so Abram goes after these kings, defeats them, and brings back the spoil. And it says, After his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, or literally king of peace, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Now, we're not told why Abram gives him a tenth of everything, but nonetheless, it's the first example we have of tithing. And in this case, he's tithing to a man who's described as King of God Most High, He's later referred to as a type of Jesus in the book of Hebrews, Melchizedek, of a priesthood that has no beginning and has no end. And of course, being the, the king of Salem or king of peace, he brings out bread and wine, which is very symbolic, of course, of the, of the Passover or of Holy Communion, the bread and the wine. So that's the first reference that we have to tithing. And as some people will point out, when they seek to justify tithing, they say this has happened before the law was given through Moses. I'll explain why it's not quite as simple as that to simply apply a passage on that basis. We then look at Leviticus chapter 27, verses 30 to 33. And in Leviticus, it begins by saying, Every tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the trees, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. If a man wishes to redeem some of his tithe, he shall add a fifth to it. And every tithe of herds and flocks, every tenth animal of all that pass under the herdsman's staff, shall be holy to the Lord. Okay, so Leviticus is making it clear that one-tenth of everything, of all produce, all animals, is to be set aside for God's purposes. In this passage, it doesn't say exactly what that means or what that looks like, but that's what needs to happen. As indeed, it talks about the firstborn of children and things like that, though they can be redeemed. In the book of Numbers, it describes it like this in chapter 18 beginning at verse 21 and finishing at verse 32. I won't read all the verses, but I will read some of them. To the Levites, I have given every tithe in Israel for an inheritance in return for their service that they do, their service in the tent of meeting, so that the people of Israel do not come near the tent of meeting, lest they bear sin and die. So the tribe of Levite has been set aside to work around the temple, to look after the temple or the tabernacle when they're in the wilderness, that's their job. They're given no inheritance in the land. They're told to live in cities. They don't have farms to plow, etc. Or they have small lots of land, but not much. And so they rely on the giving of the people. It's like a tax, as it were, so that they can be supported. <clears throat> for the tithe of the people of Israel, which they present as a contribution to the Lord, I've given to the Levites for an inheritance. But then it goes on, Moreover, you shall speak and say to the Levites, When you take from the people of Israel the tithe that I have given you from them for your inheritance, then you shall present a contribution from it to the Lord, a tithe of the tithe. And your contribution shall be counted to you as though it were the grain of the threshing floor and as the fullness of the winepress. So you shall also present a contribution to the Lord from all your tithes which you receive from the people of Israel, and from it you shall give the Lord's contribution to Aaron the priest." And so the Levites are called to tithe in order to support Aaron and the priesthood. Because how else are they going to live or receive their money, their wages? And so this is what's going on. 
In Deuteronomy chapter 12, which is also part of the law, verses 5 to 19, it describes a tithe in a very different way. But you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes to put his name and make his habitation there. There you shall go and there you shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and the contribution that you present your vow offerings, your freewill offerings and the firstborn of your herd and of your flock. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God and you shall rejoice you and your households in all that you undertake in which the Lord your God has blessed you. Later on in that same passage, it says you may not eat within the towns the tithes of your grain or of your wine or of your oil or the firstborn of your herd or of your flock or any of your vow offerings that you vow, but you shall eat them before the Lord your God in the place that the Lord your God will choose. You and your son and your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, the Levite who is within your towns, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God in all that you undertake. Take care that you do not neglect the Levite as long as you live in your land. So in this passage, the tithes are used, as it were, to go either to Jerusalem or where the tabernacle was and to throw a party, to celebrate, to enjoy the first fruits of the land. The people are enjoying this themselves, though at the end of this passage, it says, make sure you also look after the Levites because they don't have a regular wage or a regular income. Again, in Deuteronomy chapter 14, beginning at verse 22. You shall tithe all the yield of your seed that comes from the field year by year. And before the Lord your God in the place that he will choose to make his name dwell, there you shall eat the tithe of your grain, of your wine, of your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and flock. But it goes on and says, If the way is too long and it's too difficult to take all these tithes with you, then sell them, use them to make money, take the money with you, and spend the money, literally, this is what it says, for whatever you desire, oxen or sheep or wine or strong drink, whatever your appetite craves. This is a party. That's what it's describing again. They will have a celebration. In some ways, this is a beautiful expression of what we look forward to as Christians in the marriage supper of the Lamb, when we join with Jesus at the marriage supper of the Lamb and we celebrate together. So this seems to be what's happening here. Again, it says, do not neglect the Levite who is within your towns. And then here it says, at the end of every three years, you shall bring out the tithe of your produce in the same year and lay it up within your town. So it's only once every three years that this is talking about. Now, whether the other two years is to give to the Levites in, in particular, and there's one year that's for this party, I'm not sure. And to the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you and the sojourner, this is the refugees, the fatherless, that's children without families. The widows who are within your town shall come and eat and be filled, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands that you do. Again, take this wonderful time of partying and spread it around a little bit. Share it, share it with others who are not so fortunate, who don't have the resources that you have. Beautiful expression of God's love. Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 1 to 15. Again, I won't read it all. But it says, when you have finished paying all the tithe of your produce in the third year, here we have the third year again, which is the year of tithing, giving it to the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless and the widow, so that they may eat within the, your towns and be filled. Then you shall say before the Lord your God, I have removed the sacred portion out of my house and moreover I have given it to the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless and the widow, according to all your commandments that you've commanded me. I have not transgressed any of your commandments, nor have I forgotten them. I have not eaten of the tithe while I was mourning, or removed it while I was unclean, or offered it, any of it to the dead. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord my God. And as a result of that, God will give blessings to the people. So there seems to be a greater talking here in Deuteronomy to make sure that you share it around, particularly with the Levite, the refugees, the foreigners, the fatherless and the widows. Now, later on in Chronicles, we can see that the tithe is applied more in the sense of what we read about in Leviticus. And so when Hezekiah restores the Passover and restores, makes sure the priests are doing their job and gets the temple sacrifices going properly again, he commands the people who live in Jerusalem to give the portion due to the priests and the Levites that they might give themselves to the law of the Lord. This is Second Chronicles chapter 31, verses 2 to 10. And it says, And they brought in abundantly the tithe of everything, and there was so much that they have a great big, you know, they have so much that, that, that Hezekiah come and they see the heaps. They bless the Lord and the people of Israel. 
And Azariah, the chief priest, says, Since they began to bring the contributions into the house of the Lord, we've eaten and had enough and had plenty left. And of course, when these offerings weren't coming in, the priesthood, the Levites suffer. They go back and have to get secular work in order to support themselves. It's obviously not good to maintain the worship of God. So this is what's happening here. In Nehemiah, which is, of course, written after the exile, so the people of, of Judah and Benjamin have gone into exile. Then they're restored back to the promised land. And we read that part of what happens here is that the people are commanded to bring to the Levites the tithes for our ground. For it is the Levites who collect the tithes in our towns where we labor. And the priest, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive the tithes. And the Levites shall bring up the tithes of the tithes to the house of our God. So they also will give 10% to ensure that the work of the house of God continues that the priesthood is looked after. And so this is what takes place and it says we will not neglect the house of our God. In Amos chapter 4, which of course is also post-exilic, there's a suggestion in Amos that what will take place here is that even though the people are tithing and giving their sacrifices, nonetheless they're not actually carrying out justice and looking after one another. They're murdering people, they're involved in idolatry, etc. And so Amos, a bit like some of the other prophetic messages, saying, well, you keep the, the law outwardly, but your hearts are not being changed and you're not looking after one another. You're better off looking after one another and not doing the other things if you want God's blessing. But finally, we look at Haggai and Malachi. And in Haggai, the message of Haggai is saying, well, God's temple has not been rebuilt. Instead, you're making your own houses nice. You're looking after yourselves, but you're not looking after the worship of God. As a result, God is not looking after you, blessing you, and you're finding that as hard as you're working, you're not producing a great deal. So Haggai is calling the people to start looking after the temple and look after the Levites and the priests. And Malachi, a passage is often preached about in order to justify tithing for Christians, is also talking about a similar situation. And in chapter 3, verses 6 to 12, it says, you know, But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Says Malachi, yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? Okay, so Malachi is calling them to return to God. And so Malachi says, well, you're robbing God. And it says, in your tithes and contributions, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, the temple, of course, that there may be food in my house. Look after my priests. Look after my Levites. Make sure that my worship is going on. And then I will look after you, is what God's saying. If you will, New Testament application, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All the other things will be added unto you as well. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the window of heaven for you and pour down for your blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil. And your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. And so that's the final passage that we can look at in the New Testament. But hopefully you get an idea, firstly, the tithing is a little bit more complex than has often been presented in churches. That's the first thing that we need to take into consideration. But secondly, tithing is all, in the Old Testament sense, about looking after the Levites and the priests and the temple so that the worship of God can take place in the way that it needs to. It's also, if we look at some of the other passages in Deuteronomy, about looking after the widows and the orphans and the foreigners something that you only hear spoken about a little bit in terms of tithing, because normally it says the tithe is to be looking after the church and its ministers. And finally, something you never hear preached about in regards to tithing is potentially it's an opportunity to throw a party and to celebrate the blessings of God in our lives. And that is considered just as much a genuine expression of tithing as anything else that we've talked about. So we need to take those things into consideration as we as we look at my next talk, where we look at how we apply this for us as Christians in the light of Jesus Christ and what has taken place on the cross. Hope this is helpful. God bless.